What's going on, YouTube? Adam, Dave, and Young Heath over there. We have Dynasty Talk for you today, plus some NFL Combine news. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, and Dave, I'm going to keep this one short. Here we go. It is a Dynasty episode of Fantasy Football today. If you're not in a Dynasty League, you should listen anyway. We're talking about trade values for players and what we think about them for 2022 and beyond. Plus, we have a ton of news items from the NFL Combine. Coaches, GMs have been speaking, a lot of quarterback notes to get to. And Heath Cummings wants to make a trade on the air that I think would be you know, with Dave Richard in their Dynasty League. So, Heath, the floor is yours. Yeah, we've tried this before and um, haven't been able to pull it off. But I, I think we're in a unique situation now to where Dave has a glut of running backs in our Dynasty League. I have a Shocker. glut of rookie draft picks in our dynasty league um mm. and i just wonder like if he's going to start all those running backs now dave if you'll remember tanked last year and so right it's now in his starting lineup Jarrett patterson and jeff wilson are his starting running backs and those are not the running backs i'm interested in trading for <laughs> but he has david montgomery he has elijah mitchell he has Tony Pollard, he has Cam Akers, Michael Carter, Kareem Hunt. That's that's six running backs. Yeah, and he, he could use some more uh, some more youth on his roster. How about a little love for Jake Funk, by the way? Uh, don't no, fake no the love funk, for Jake Dave. Funk. No, don't. He's on, fake he's on the, the team funk. too. Crickets. He, he will he, he will not be on the team once Dave has to cut his roster down to make room for his 2022 draft picks. All right, Heath. So, what are we thinking here? Let's make a trade. Let's make it happen, Dave. You definitely need to make a trade. I, no, I, think I don't. Have to. You have to make a trade. No, Dave, I don't have just, to. I, why don't, I think the easiest way to go about this would you just tell me like which because all of your running backs are kind of in the sameish range as well. Yeah. Um. I don't know that you necessarily have a top ten running back, and I think you have like seven top thirty running backs. This so. Is true. Who are the running backs that you value the least amongst your running backs? Like, I'm just going to trade for the cheaper ones. And this is, well, I think, there's this is Funk. trade strategy 101. If there's three or four guys that you don't really see a big difference between on someone's roster at the same position, just ask them, who's the cheapest? But I also know that running back depth is important in fantasy football. It's kind of been, I, I might as well have it tattooed on my back at this point. Yeah. So I don't or I don't necessarily back. want to give it up, especially considering the fact that as you said, Heath, I don't have I don't have that gem, you know, PSA ten style running back for my lineup. I've got a bunch of guys that are startable for sure, and a couple that could become potentially gems. I think you look at Akers, you look at Carter, uh, Elijah Mitchell. Like they've got a chance, even though we can make the case against all three Who's of them. Who's the cheapest, Dave? Let's go make the trade. All you didn't mention. You didn't mention Dave Montgomery. Is he cheaper than Mitchell and Carter and Acres? He might be. Um, I also kind of don't want to let you know which one I think is the cheapest. Well, see, this is the thing that just chaps my like rule one oh one. Here we of go. Of completing a trade, if we're not going to have open lines of communication, then we're not going to be able to put a deal. Like if we Why can't should talk I? about how we value players. I then what's the point of even trying to negotiate? I think the better thing for you to do is for you to rank those running backs. Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell me about it. I've you, already you ranked rank those running backs mind. multiple places online. You have to click like three links to find how I view those running backs. Well, that's this like is a not a mystery. Let, 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 it's all out there. All right. Well, well, he says he wants the cheapest one. Okay. So I would say that Kareem Hunt is the one that you have ranked the lowest of that bunch. <sighs> And I will give away this information. Kareem Hunt is the one that I would be most willing to trade from that group. Okay. Heath, what would you like to give up for Kareem Hunt? Oh, if you're offering me 101 for Kareem Hunt, uh, I think I will say yes. I do have both 101 and 102 in that league. You have I will take both of those for Kareem Hunt. Adam, yeah. that's a deal. <laughs> Neither of those are available. Damn. Um, I I would probably though give up um, an early second round pick for Kareem Hunt. And what I would tell you is that's a no for now. But if there's a player that slides in our rookie only draft, and I'm like, oh, I gotta have him, you know, like I felt about Paris Campbell once upon a time. Mm -hmm. What a trade that was between us, Heath. Oh my God. Um, then maybe I would give up 
Kareem Hunt for that early second round pick. But for now, no, I would not do it just for the early second. So you think you have six running backs that are worth a first round pick in the rookie draft? It doesn't matter if I think that they're worth a first or a second round pick or not. I'm not willing to trade off Kareem Hunt just for a pick that I don't necessarily have a plan on. Like I yeah. couldn't even tell you, I couldn't even tell you how I've ranked the running backs and receivers in this rookie class yet. So once a, once a, if I if I get to a point where I see fifteen, well, this is a fourteen team dynasty league, and Heath, I'm assuming right. that you're offering the first pick in round two. I don't I'm even know sure if you have have that one, but two. right. I don't know. I don't know. You've got all the picks. I have but, the first or the second, one of the two. It's fourteen. So let's say it's the either. second pick in round two. That means I would have to have a ranked list of sixteen rookies that I would rather have than Kareem Hunt for me to make that trade. And right now, I don't have that list. I don't even know who's won for me. Yeah. Okay, I think so, it's, it's sorry. interesting, I though. I mean, it's, that's, a, right now. that's a fair trade offer. It's a good range. Right. And what about, yeah. I, I do think we should maybe explore that a little bit further. Are you saying that you would just never trade? Like, you traded Tom Brady for the 14th pick in the draft without knowing I, who was going I to be in the I didn't know it was going to be the 14th, and I probably would have done it even if I did know that it was the 14th. But you didn't know who your 14th ranked player was then, but you were willing to take the draft pick. Yeah, because I was trading a player who I knew didn't have much time left in the league. I didn't know he was down to like single digit games by the time I traded him. Yeah. I, I assumed Brady would play at least one more year. I figured, okay, this is a depreciating asset. I had Joe Burrow and uh, uh, I was taking Hunt is also a depreciating asset. I agree. <laughs> okay. All right. We're on to something here, folks. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated. See if he, th- uh, let's see, you know, let's get to the NFL. No, yeah. for now. It's, it's not a, it's not a, I'm not slamming the door in Heath's face. What about a late first for David Montgomery? I'm probably more interested in the hunt for the second than I am for Montgomery in the first. Again, first? if I, if that late first is like what? 10th. If I, if I got a list of 10 rookies that I love, got to have, and Montgomery is the price I have to pay to get one of them. I would do it. But David, or David, why did I say David? Gabriel Davis is the guy that I had to part with last year to just move up in our rookie draft to get Michael Carter because I wanted Michael Carter that badly. And now I feel kind of like a dope because Gabriel Davis looks like you, be you feel like a good. dope for trading Gabriel Davis for Michael Carter. No, he got Gabriel well, Davis and another pick. Yeah, it was Davis oh. and another pick. It was just to move up. Oh, OK. And I think it was to move up like three or four spots. It wasn't even like a huge move up. I might be wrong on that. All right, let me promote a few things here. Schrager Please. usually tells me what to promote. He didn't tell me today. He's uh, he's off today. So promote whatever the hell we want. We're going to have a, nice. yeah, we're going to have a March Madness bracket challenge to get into the podcast league. We'll let you know about that. I'll send out a link when I create the March Madness challenge, you know, fill out your bracket. I think Heath did really well last year if I recall. From what I, yeah, that's that's how what I recall as well. <laughs> One of these last two years, I think he did really well. So I want thousands of people in this. Last year we didn't have that many, if I recall, something like eight hundred. That's really weak. I want thousands of people in this, and uh, a really big bracket challenge. And CBS is the best place to do it. And that's all we really have to promote. Dave Heath and I were talking about our favorite in excess songs before. Uh, the show started. If you're watching on YouTube and you want to comment with your favorite song by NXS, please do. And we were talking about the sh- TV show Euphoria. So maybe we'll get to that at the end of today's show. Dave has controversial dynasty advice. Hmm. That I don't think you should listen to. I think this is really bad advice. Goes against Terrible. everything everything I believe in. Dave, do you still believe in this this thing that you tweeted yesterday? Don't offer a deal that you wouldn't accept yourself. That wasn't the original tweet. <laughs> we we I just don't think you want to see the original tweet. Or say it. You can see it all you want. I don't have a bleep button, but it was right. And I don't want to make you edit. So what well, was what? I'm don't not... offer crappy deals or something? Yeah, right. That's fine. Don't offer crap. We'll say crap. Okay. That's, a, uh, that's a and so of... this this all started with Cal Shoemaker posting a uh, a tweet about what what are the what should be the ten commandments of dynasty? Was it dynasty trade advice? I think it was, and that was my knee jerk response: is don't offer crap. And when I say that, it's it's offering your fourth round pick for David Montgomery in a dynasty league, uh, making an offer that you know has zero point zero percent of a chance of getting accepted, but you offer it anyway just to initiate trade talks. I'm using air quotes for people <laughs> that are listening. All right, it's it's a horrible thing to do. If you want to initiate trade talks, 
offer a deal that you would conceivably accept if it were offered to you. Put that deal out there. It doesn't have to be your best deal, but it's got to be a deal that at least doesn't make the person receiving it go, what a joke, reject, and then they block you from any future trades. Your reputation, especially in a dynasty league where you're playing with other people year after year, I think it matters a little bit. Nah. This isn't like an FFPC league where you're playing with other strangers. You want to offer those crap trades all the time. Go for it. But I, I think in a dynasty league where you want to try and have a relationship with other fantasy managers in your league, it's important to not be an idiot. Go ahead and put an offer out there that's it, it doesn't have to, like I said, doesn't have to be your best offer, but it's got to be something that you would at least say, okay, maybe if this were offered to me, I would take it myself. I don't know. You never know when people are going to accept a horrible trade offer. And if anybody gets so mad about a bad trade offer that they're going to not talk to you or shun you from trading or would never trade with you again, then they're probably a little bit too sensitive and you should think about getting other friends. But I look, I get it. I I've get been it. friends with you all this time and you still make terrible trade offers. Exactly. Cause I know you're and not, that's not even in all. dynasty leagues. That's in regular redraft. But I, I, I'll tell you what, I would defer to Heath on this one because Heath's got more dynasty experience than I do. What's the best way to initiate a trade in a dynasty league, Heath? I I think the first statement that Adam put in the notes was um, way different than what you just said. So I don't have anything problem with what you just said. Yeah, like you, you should make an offer that it's at least conceivable someone might. And I think maybe even taking it a step further, you need to like look at the other team's roster and at least try to figure out what they're trying to do. Don't offer DeAndre Hopkins to a team that's rebuilding. Um, don't offer a team that's a top contender, a first round pick for one of their best players. It doesn't make any sense. That's not what they're doing right now. They're trying to win or they're trying to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Like at least make the offers make sense. What and about finding the teams where you think there's a fit? I'm sorry, Adam. That's finding right. the teams where you think there's a fit. And instead of making an offer, you just send a text or an email to them. Hey, are you, I, I think you might be interested in having Cooper cup on your team. Would you like to talk about making a trade for Cooper cup? Maybe be like, Hey, I see you have five running backs that are all basically the same. Which one would be the cheapest? No, fair. That is, that totally is, fair. Totally it fair. is a good strategy in all types of leagues is to sort of empower the other manager and say, Hey, I, you know, you know, put it in their court and let them make the first offer. I, I think that's a good way to reach out to someone and, and uh, make them more mm. excited about it rather than just throwing a trade offer in their inbox. I think we all agree. You don't want to be mediocre in dynasty leagues. Uh, you want to either go for it or, or rebuild. I mean, look, it might be a league where you're, you know, six teams make the playoffs. So you think you have a shot, but I've kind of been stuck in mediocrity in this one league for a really long time. And, um, I wish I had been more aggressive in tanking to be quite not tanking, but uh, getting some future picks. And I, I haven't. So, um, yeah, don't, don't be mediocre. I think unless you guys disagree, we can move on to our next segment here, which is not about dynasty at all. It's combine news and notes. And after this, we will uh, we'll do one player at each position that has a lot to gain or lose. We'll debate DeAndre Swift versus Christian McCaffrey, CD lamb versus DK Metcalf versus AJ Brown. We'll talk about some, some mid range tight ends who, Maybe they have a lot of upside. Maybe they don't. TJ Hawkins and Dallas Goddard, what do we think about them going forward? But right now, let's just run through the news and notes, some of the things, some of the headlines that we've seen coming out of the combine. And here we go. Miami will not be trading for Deshaun Watson. Seattle has no intention of trading Russell Wilson. Bruce Arians said that he won't trade Tom Brady. If Brady wants to come back, he said, you know, we're not in bad business. We're not going to trade him to another team. And that he also said that Tampa Bay is unlikely to trade for a veteran quarterback. And he also said that Jameis Winston, they wouldn't close the door on it, but that's probably not the best spot for Jameis Winston. So it could be Kyle Trask's time in Tampa. Right. That's what that's what they're making it out to be. Could be. They're yeah. trash. So, finding a so much for all these trades about of quarterbacks that were getting hyped up a month ago. It, it's good news if your name is uh, Jameis Winston or maybe even Mitchell Trubisky or Marcus Mariota. Sure. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo is having shoulder surgery that's going to sideline him until the summer. And I, there's a guy that's going to get traded. Yeah, but I mean that's not ideal. <laughs> it seems like a really good plan by Jimmy Garoppolo if he wanted to stay in San Francisco. Right. It was his idea to have the surgery. Uh, you're trading for a guy. You want to get him into the new system, whatever. Look, maybe the trade happens late, but you want to have him in for the for the full off season. And he's having uh, sh uh, shoulder surgery, so Garoppolo won't be throwing until the summer. Philadelphia general manager Howie Roseman supported Jalen Hurts and San Francisco GM 
John Lynch supported Trey Lance. He said that he's everything they thought he was when they traded up for him. Shockers. I, I, I do wonder like how 49ers fans feel about that with what it cost the 49ers to go get him and the level of play that we got from Jimmy Garoppolo last year and the fact that Lance could not take the job from Garoppolo. What did you, when you say the level of play we got from Garoppolo, that might be something people are split on. What do you think? Right. It was fine, fine right? Yeah. It wasn't good. It wasn't bad. It was fine. It, it was both good and bad, I guess, actually. There was some good and there was some, like, disastrously bad. Yeah, well, he had the, the Titans game. He hurt his thumb, and he was awful after the thumb. Uh, and obviously played with a shoulder injury and a thumb injury. He was in a lot of pain down the stretch. But, uh, yeah. So was Baker it. Mayfield. And Baker was awful. I mean, at least Garoppolo was better than that. Uh, anyway, it was kind of standby or man at the Combine. Arthur Smith expects Matt Ryan to be on the Falcons but it didn't say definitively. Uh, Kevin O'Connell, Minnesota's new head coach, said Kirk Cousins is their guy. Uh, it's pretty clear the Giants are willing to trade just about anyone, including Saquon Barkley. Detroit acknowledged they need an outside wide receiver. We're going to get to the Gronk thing. That's probably the most interesting thing. We'll save it for last. A couple of other news items here. Kansas City will likely use the franchise tag on left tackle Orlando Brown. Oh, the Lions have not decided on a play caller next season. Keith, how much is that going to impact your projections when they do establish who will call plays? Not much because Dan Campbell was not as much of an outlier as Anthony Lynn in the games that he called plays. Um, and so if if it's Campbell or if it's the the new guy, is it Ben Johnson? Ben Johnson. Um, I, I'm going to project pretty close to a league norm in terms of their play calling. Okay. They're going to want to run it a lot. They still love their offensive line. And they look at that as a superior strength for their team. So wouldn't surprise me in the least if they were, at least when games were competitive, a little more conservative. Mike Kosicki is a franchise candidate, franchise tag candidate. He's not really a franchise tight end. That's according to Pro Football Network. Uh, Rondell Moore will be a bigger part of the offense. And we talked about him last <laughs> Monday. He has to be. I think we talked about him earlier this Monday, week. yeah. They're running out of receivers if they're going to... Christian Kirk is going to be a popular free agent. Uh, I, I think I read somewhere that he was hanging with Josh Allen uh, during the offseason already. A.J. Green, I don't see him getting re-signed by Arizona. Maybe there's a chance. Andy Isabella has been given permission to seek a trade. So they've got Nuke. They've got Antoine Wesley. Wesley. And they've got Rondell Moore. So they're they're going to add to that group more than anything else and more should get an opportunity to actually catch passes further than like five yards downfield that they, the Cardinals and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I just, uh, this week published the 2022 opportunity index. Ooh. And those two teams have more than 700 vacated opportunities. That's targets Ooh. plus running back rush attempts, 755 wow. for Tampa Bay, 713 uh -huh. for Arizona. No other team has more than 519. So like wow. enormous amounts of opportunity in those two places. And it, it's partially to say, you know, there could be somebody that steps up, but also like maybe they're going to bring in wide receiver help, but they've got to spend money at running back. They've probably got to spend money at tight end. Like one of those three spots, they probably can't fill them all. Yeah, it'd be a big question. We talked about this with more on Monday. You know, this is a guy whose dot was, I think, 1.2 yards. That was his average depth of target, 1.2 yards. So a lot of it was behind the line of scrimmage. I mean, Dave, you said more than five yards downfield. <laughs> more than, how about negative five yards downfield? He just was a gadget player, which I think, I, I remember having this conversation when he got drafted. I was a little concerned about Rondell Moore. He just seemed like a great athlete at Purdue. He was. He kind of out-athleted out everybody. I don't like to pretend to be a scout or anything. He just didn't feel like a polished receiver. And then to me anyway, and then uh, I think Keith, you said, you said, yeah, but Arizona was a great landing space for him because of the way they would use him. And I think all of that sort of played out, but they didn't, you know, but he, I just wish they had used him more as a regular receiver well, to know what to expect going forward. And he's not Tyreek Hill. So I'm not calling him Tyreek Hill, 
But Tyreek Hill was not a polished route runner when he came into the NFL. Tyreek Hill was used as more of a gadget player his first year in the NFL, and then they transitioned more his second year, and then his third year he became a true number one wide receiver. I don't think Rondale Moore is going to be Tyreek Hill. I want to clarify that again. But (laughs) they're already talking about wanting to use him outside this year, expanding his roles. What we don't know is how players progress in different ways. Some players are really good at learning new skills even in the nfl and and you know, diversifying their game if he does that he could still be a very good fantasy wide receiver but he has things he has to improve he's right, not healthy too that's always been an issue with him let's talk about rob gronkowski the bills are reportedly interested in rob gronkowski according to the athletic how fun would that be would you draft him as a as the number six tight end after you know Whatever order, Kelsey, Andrews, no, Waller, Kittle, Pitt. No. no, where would you draft? You, you might, you eight. might talk me into eight. Yep, but I think it's more like nine. Is Why? Where you'd fit in. So, who besides Dallas Goddard? Who else are you putting in front of him? Schultz, Hawkinson. Uh Hawkinson for sure. Um, Schultz, if he's back in Dallas, probably. Yeah, that's Hawkinson what I'm assuming. for sure. What Hawkinson for sure, sure, especially if it's PPR. Yeah, but you might uh, Gronk might catch seven more touchdowns than TJ Hawkinson. I don't think that that's crazy hyperbole. No. I think that that's um, possible, but I also wonder about how many targets he gets with Josh Allen there. But this is a team that still I still think they're going to throw plenty, even though Brian Dable is leaving. But. There's there's plenty. Uh, look, there was plenty of target competition for Gronk in in Tampa. We uh, more there than there would be and in Buffalo. Yeah, maybe there's a chance he does get around seven targets per he game. Just like, are, you don't think T.J. Hawkins is going to catch a touchdown pass? He just played the last two years with Tom Brady in one of the best offenses in football, and in neither year did he have more than seven touchdown passes catches. I still think he's got that skill. He had six touchdown catches in twelve games last year. Hawkinson had four touchdown catches in twelve games last year. I mean, that's just it, Dawson Knox had nine touchdown catches last year. So, so he had six and 12 and Hawkinson had four and 12. Yeah. And Gronk hasn't had more than eight since 2015. You really think it's crazy that he could have seven more touchdowns that he could have 10 I, touchdowns? I think it's more likely that Hawkinson plays seven more games than Gronk than it is Gronk scores seven more touchdowns. If they but I'm done. I'm yeah, but I'm done docking Gronk for injury. Like I, th- I think he, he could always miss two or three games, but I, I think that he's he's a th- going to be a thirty-three year old tight end that has that's okay missed How- games basically every year but twenty twenty. Isn't Kelsey thirty-two? But Kelsey plays sixteen games almost every year. Last year was seventeen. Well, I would did Dawson Knox lead the team in red zone targets? Because the thing is, you know, Mike Evans was such, a, was such a red zone hog, and I'm just going to check. I got it. I got it. I'll look. Uh, you know, so I just think that, oh, no, Diggs had uh, 34, Knox had 18. Inside the 10 yard line, Diggs had 14, Knox had 10. Knox did miss three games, I think. So I Knox was like second. Yeah, basically. he was second. Mm-hmm. Well, I would imagine that would mostly shift to Gronk if Gronk is there. Right. That's what I was saying. Maybe seven's a little much, but he'll out touchdown TJ Hawkinson. If he's on the bills, but I hope it happens. That would be a lot of fun. All right. It's a dynasty show. So let's talk dynasty. <laughs> Nothing says dynasty like Rob Gronkowski, <laughs> by the way, you know, you got to talk about the rookies here and the latest mock draft from Ryan Wilson, which he published on February 28th. He had five wide receivers going in the first round. This does look like a pretty good wide receiver class. He had two guys from Ohio state, but he had in this order, Garrett Wilson of Ohio state, who I believe he had mocked at number 11 overall. Traylon Burks of Arkansas, Drake London of USC, Jamison Williams of Alabama, who's coming off a torn ACL, and Chris Olave of Ohio State, right at the end of round one. Go to cbsports.com's NFL draft rankings, their prospect rankings. We have five running backs in the top 90, I want to say. And those would be Isaiah Spiller of Texas A&M, Brees Hall of, uh, of Iowa State, Kenneth Walker of Michigan State, Kyron Williams of Notre Dame and Kennedy Brooks of Oklahoma. And three of those guys, very, very involved in the passing game. Isaiah Spiller, again, a and Reese Hall, Iowa State, Kyron Williams, Notre Dame. Oh, 
Spiller had 74 catches in three seasons. Brees Hall had 23, 23, and 36 catches in three seasons. Kyron Williams had 77 catches for Notre Dame in his last two seasons. So they've shown that ability uh, out of the backfield and running routes. That's excellent stuff. So, give I don't know. me, so yeah, go ahead. Give me Isaiah Spiller to Arizona, and give me Brees Hall to Atlanta, and let's let's go. Like I I I still think I'm not as excited yet about Walker as I am the other two, but I do kind of feel like it's at running back at least Hall Spiller Walker. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. And I think for Walker, I've been I've been pumping him so much. I, well, a little bit anyway. I haven't talked that much about these guys, but you got. I don't think I could make him the number one guy right now, just because he's kind of like, more like an old school bruiser, and I don't think he looks like a third down guy. He's someone who had 13 catches last year, 19 catches in his career at Michigan State. I just assume that, that you don't awesome. love Brees Hall because every time you watch him, you see David Montgomery, and you hate David he, Montgomery. He does like Spiller looks. To me, like the most explosive of this group. And we've got a lot to, to, you know, we'll have Emery Hunt on and we'll have the guys who do this for a living. But I don't know. That, you are a Brees Hall guy. I'm going to plant my flag for, for Isaiah Spiller. He's going to be my, my favorite running back. In this somebody game. showed on Twitter just uh, a couple of days ago, and I don't remember who it was. So sorry. Credit to you. Um, it's, <laughs> it's really silly to debate Brees Hall versus Isaiah Spiller right now. They are both really, really good. We'll see who gets the most draft capital and the best landing spot, and that will be the favorite. Yeah, probably. All right, so uh, that it does factor in, though, when you're looking at dynasty rankings here. You know, do you think, Heath, there's a realistic scenario, one of these running backs, one of these wide receivers that's going to go in the first round for the wide receivers, maybe the late first or second round for the running backs, becomes a top 12 overall dynasty player instantly? <laughs> Probably not instantly, but by next year, yes. Okay. I think Hall or Spiller could have the type of year in their rookie year that puts them in the where Najee Harris or I mean Javante Williams split all year and still moved into the top twelve. Um, yeah. So yes, I, I think, and definitely whoever the best wide receiver is will probably be a top twelve pick at the end of next year. Here's a random question, Dave: Would you rather have Travis Etienne or the Third pick, uh, fifth pick of a rookie draft of the rookie draft. I might lean toward the fifth pick of the rookie draft because there's some intriguing receivers to go with the running backs that we've talked about. And it feels like what's, what's the ceiling for ETN to be a passing downs back at this point. Wait well, a second. That's Alvin so Kamara harsh. is probably the ceiling. That's so harsh. Okay. That's his ceiling. All I right. Maybe so it being hard. Alvin Kamara is the ceiling. He's tricky, though. I mean, that's not an easy guy to evaluate. Nope. I, I have the first, uh, I think, eight picks ahead of ETN right okay. now. So, okay. All right, let's move on. We'll, we'll get we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, one player at each position that could move. Well, I don't know how the best way to phrase this. What's the best way to frame this uh, segment here? I'm not sure which segment it is. So, one player at each position. Is yes, what the segment game. says. Yeah, I thought that's. What so I understand saying. why you were confused after that. Um, I think what you said was, <laughs> "Do you have some guys you'd like to talk about?" Because this is not one player at each position. It's three players no, it at two it. positions, two players at one position, and one player at one position. One um, topic for each position. One topic for each position, and the first one is a guy who could move a lot during free agency. It's Jameis Winston. Um. I don't know that him re-signing in this current situation in New Orleans is going to move the whole needle a whole lot, other than the fact that we will be guaranteed he's a starter. And if you got a three-year deal to stay in New Orleans, like for legitimate money, then I think that would move it quite a bit. Where would you see him going? Top 18-ish? 18-ish seemed right to me. Okay. I think we have more interesting positions to talk about since we did just talk about quarterback dynasty not too long ago so we're going to take a break and when we come back we're going to talk about multiple players at each position including this debate at running back would you rather have deandre swift javante williams or christian mccaffrey in your dynasty league and we'll talk about the running back landscape as a whole which is pretty interesting right now we'll take a break when we come back rb debates in dynasty 
So, Dave Richard, would you rather have Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, or Christian McCaffrey in your dynasty league? Who's the highest? The knee-jerk, the knee-jerk reaction for me is Javante Williams just because he's young. There's plenty of upside left. I'm not as worried about injury risk with him as I am with Swift and certainly with McCaffrey. The only thing that might change my mind is if I've got a dynasty team that's in win-now mode and the allure of getting Christian McCaffrey – theoretically at a discount because of what's happened to him the past two seasons would make me want to get him on the squad for the next year to two years versus Javante who might legitimately have five years in front of him. Yeah. I think if you were looking at it in terms of like dynasty upside, I would rank it McCaffrey Swift Williams. And if you're looking at it in terms of dynasty downside i'd probably rank it williams swift mccaffrey i think swift second in both that's um, a little confusing are you saying i think mccaffrey has the most upside but also the isn't most it downside. more about like safe most downside when you say most downside do you mean just like safe playing it safe i no, i mean that christian mccaffrey is going to be 26 years old this year and if he has another injury his value is probably not a top 25 running back in fantasy and dynasty because then he'll be 27 going in the next year with three straight major injuries. We'll be Got done it. with him. So Christian McCaffrey's downside is one play and the first round asset that you have is almost worthless. I don't know if you remember, but we did a dynasty show last year or two years ago where I went through the ages of all the players that finished top five. And I think 26 was the most productive age for running backs and wide receivers. You remember that by any chance? I remember that 26 or 27, like 27 to 28 was when the fall off started. I don't necessarily remember that 26 was better than 24, but I know 24 to 26 is the peak for running backs or for everything yeah. and receiver. Yeah. 26 is a really good year. And I was just looking, Austin Eckler did just have his age 26 season. So something to keep in mind, it seems to be popping up age 26, very productive 20 after 28 for a running back. And you don't find a lot of good, a lot of great seasons. You really just don't after 28. So Definitely something to uh, to consider. Okay, I think these guys are are what in your rankings? Dynasty running backs three, four, three, five. four. I have Swift at three, Williams at four, McCaffrey at five. You go Taylor, Najee, Swift, Javante, McCaffrey. Correct. All right, Dave. What is your overall thought on the running back position? Because when you're talking about three, four, five in our dynasty rankings, you're talking about Swift and then Heaths. Who's never played more than 13 games and isn't really a feature back, or, or maybe he's like a, mo- a new era feature back. You're talking about Javante Williams, who's proven very little, and Christian McCaffrey, who's barely played the last two seasons. Is are we looking at a a just a bad state at running back? No, because I think there's still a lot of running backs who can put up numbers. I just think that you have to look at the position as a little more disposable than it's even been in the past. And it's almost like it's better off if you have a short-term view of the running backs in Dynasty, unless you've got that rare young back that either has proven that he can be an excellent running back, like Jonathan Taylor, somebody like that. Najee Harris has proven that he can be a really good back. I don't know if excellent is the word I would use. Or you've got a running back that has the potential to do it. And Javante would be the first name that would roll off my tongue in that regard. Michael Carter isn't necessarily in that same tier as Javante Williams, but he's got a chance to play five plus years. Two years ago, I would have said the exact same thing about Saquon Barkley though. And I would have said that Saquon Barkley, he's got five more great years in front of him. Christian McCaffrey two years ago. Oh, hell yeah. He's going to be amazing for the next five years at minimum. And you can see how fast that falls apart. Could absolutely happen to the Taylors and, and Javante Williams is of the fantasy world. So I just, you got, I, I think it's almost better off to go. I don't want to say zero RB when it comes to dynasty, but you almost want to not invest too heavily in that position outside of rookie only picks. Cause I think if you've got a rookie only pick and you've got somebody who you think can be productive for a long time, staring you in the face, you take them. That's what those rookie picks are for. But when you're trying to make a trade, I think you almost have to devalue that position a little bit more than you would in a regular redraft league. And if you've got like five or six of them that have been oh, that are being right. devalued, this is you true. Should probably you should probably get them off your <laughs> roster. And then so how do you value someone like 
Dalvin Cook, who will be in his age 27 season, or Joe Mixon, who will be in his age 26 season. I mean, can we expect three more good years from Joe Mixon? And does that make him a, a top 12 running back? Does that make him a top 12 overall player? You know, give me a Joe Mixon analysis in the Dynasty League. He is my number eight running back, but not a top 12 player. I think he's worth a second round pick. Um, it it helps him. Like he's in that same range. There's a bunch of guys after you get past, like we talked about my three through five. Then I've got Eckler at six and Dobbins at seven. And then there's a lot of running backs between 25 to 27, 28 that are kind of interspersed next. Um, but yeah, I think you can count on two more good years from Joe Mixon. And hope you get a third. Yeah, we need Dobbins. We need Acres. We need that class of 20. Was that 2020? Yes. We were so excited about them going into 2021. We need them to kind of carry the load because we, we, where's Zeke? Where Where's our Zeke? Where's our Dalvin Cook? Where's our workhorse running backs? I don't know how many of those exist anymore. I don't think they are. I think they just may not. But still, there will be running backs. I mean, there are one, two, three, four, five running backs who were in my top 10 back in September who are no longer. Who? Um, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, Saquon Barkley, Aaron Jones, Ezekiel Elliott. Oh, very flimsy position. All right, let's go to our next debate. We'll go to uh, wide receiver. Yeah, disposable is a good word. Flimsy's not. C.D. Lamb versus D.K. Metcalf versus A.J. Brown. Lamb, Metcalf, Brown. Is that the way you rank it, Heath? It is. Okay, Dave, how would you rank them in Dynasty? Lamb, Metcalf, Brown. Uh, I'm very tempted to rank them in the exact opposite order. <laughs> I think that. I think that. I think that's that's why I chose these three because I think Dave is closer to the public ranking of them than I am. So you'd go. So Dave is thinking Brown, Metcalf, Lamb, and Heath has it Lamb, Metcalf, Brown. Okay, debate. Dave, go. I'm, I'm a little skittish on Lamb after what happened in the second half of last season. <clears throat> what would make me, what would make me feel a lot better is if Amari Cooper was off that roster and they brought in a different receiver to work in three receiver sets, and they bring in Gallup, they bring back Schultz, and Lamb becomes the number one, and we see. We see him become the alpha in that offense like I thought he was going to be. There were two times last year where I thought we were seeing that. Once was in the preseason. It just looked like it was happening. Dak was talking up Lamb uh, differently than he was talking up other receivers in that offense. And every single play that we saw on social media was him picking passes off the helmets of opposing DBs. At minimum, it looked like it was going to be a bad year for the Cowboys defensive backs. That didn't happen. But it did happen where Lamb got off to a good start, got a lot of targets, and then something shifted in that offense. And Lamb, I'll tell you what happened. Michael Gallup came back, and they used Lamb a lot more in the slot, and he wasn't nearly as efficient as he was when he was outside. It's weird. And I'm wondering if that's if that continues to happen, that makes me a little bit nervous about Lamb. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time working on DK Metcalf this offseason. I've already started. I've got a stat that's wild. First half of the year, those first eight games when DK Metcalf was on fire, second year in a row, by the way, where he was awesome in the first eight games of the year, he converted almost 92% of his air yards into receiving yards. I've never seen anything like that. And you go back and you watch, he, he's, he's not running as many downfield routes in those first eight games. He's, he's actually, for him, running routes really well because he's not as, as fluid and shifty as someone like, A.J. Brown, for example, and he was getting open. He was making contested catches. He was catching off target throws, whether they were from Russ or from Geno Smith. He looked the part of a guy. You'll like this, Adam, a guy who could be the best receiver in the National Football League. He looked like it. And then I haven't really dug into the second half of the year. My guess is that they were trying him on more downfield stuff and he wasn't converting nearly as much. I believe don't quote me on it, but the air yard conversion rate in the second half of the year was less than 40 percent. So that's a humongous change when you think about it, and that yeah. means he was being used differently. That's something that I'll write about at some point this year, maybe sooner than later. And then A.J. Brown is elusive. We've seen him put up huge numbers before with Ryan Tannehill as his quarterback. Tannehill won't be his quarterback forever. Eventually, he will get a quarterback, fingers crossed, that's better than Tannehill, and he could really take off. And the way that the NFL is right now, I think that wide receivers – 
that can make plays after the catch and can do a bunch of different things to get open on their own are going to be extremely valuable and heavily targeted. A.J. Brown fits that to a T, and I think he's got a long time to go. I, th- I like all three of these guys, but Brown is the one who's my favorite. Game three. Yeah, these guys are uh, five, six, and eight for me at wide receiver, so I don't dislike any of them. I, I almost jumped in in the middle. I feel like it's going to lose effect that I didn't. But the fact that we started a C.D. Lamb versus D.K. Metcalf debate with concern over what C.D. Lamb did in the second half of last year um cd lamb was oh, a lot fair, better than fair. a lot better than dk metcalf in the second half last year um and i i feel like there is amongst the three of them a better chance for lamb situation to improve because gallup could be gone cooper could be gone there's more t- i don't i don't think tyler lockett's going anywhere right now they love him and i i think it's less likely that Dak goes somewhere than russell wilson but maybe the the thing that is the tiebreaker for me is that at the start of this year, C.D. Lamb's going to be 23 years old. At the start of this season, A.J. Brown's going to be 25. It's a two-year difference, and I think you have more reason for hope for Lamb to improve on his skill set at a younger age with less experience in the league. And I don't think it's unfair to be more concerned about A.J. Brown's health than the other two. Yeah, uh, sure. Now, okay, who's seven, by the way, in between? Tyreek Hill. Okay. Is Cooper Cup ahead or behind these three? Uh, it, it, every time I update it, Cooper Cup is a guy who moves a little bit. Right now, he's fourth. And um, the, the thing is, that's a that's a question that's entirely dependent on the state of your team. Um, for a rebuilding team, it's not close. You'd much rather have any of these three guys. But for a contender, I'd rather have Cup. Now, we saw, we're talking Lamb, Metcalf, A.J. Brown. Are they ahead of Joe Mixon in your dynasty rankings? Um, I think he's probably right in the middle of them. Uh, no, he's he's behind all of them. Mixon's behind all of them. Okay, Lamb is yeah. it, overall. I've got Lamb ten, Metcalf eleven, Brown thirteen. Joe Mixon's twentieth. And what about the DeAndre Swift, Javante Williams, McCaffrey group? Those three are ahead of the wide receivers for me. How about you, Dave? Would you take these young stud receivers or Swift, Javante, McCaffrey? Or does it depend I, on the team? I think if we're doing a rookie startup draft, I think I'd lean toward the receivers. I am a little bit concerned with Metcalf that his first eight games of the 2020 season are sort of propping up his, his value because – you know, Dave, you talked about it's been two years in a row, first eight games, but let's take a look at the difference here. The first eight games of 2020, his 17, he averaged almost 100 yards per game, 98.5 yards per game. The first eight games of 2021, not even close, 72.5 yards per game. So even when he was, he was on pace for 17 touchdowns and fewer targets, but you know, 15 yards per catch compared to like 18 and a half yards per catch. He wasn't as good in this eight game stretch as he was in the eight game stretch in 2020. So as much as I love DK Metcalf, I don't know. I, I guess I'm a little concerned that even when Russell Wilson was awesome at the beginning of the year, here were the yards, here were the yards for DK Metcalf in the four games that Metcalf, that Wilson started and finished 60, 53, 107 and 65. Then he had 98 the next week uh, with a partial game from Russell Wilson, to be fair. But I don't know. I mean, I mean that like, his his 17 game pace in those first eight games that you referenced was 1,232 yards. That's not that good. It's not bad, but it's not a guy I'm taking in the first round of a dynasty draft, I guess. And, and then and then obviously the second half was much worse, which I think was largely uh, partially due to Russell Wilson and. The rest is a damn mystery. He also had a foot injury that he was playing with, and he had foot surgery, so that could have been a big part of it too. But I guess what I'm saying is we've had now three seasons of Metcalf. First eight games of 2020 might be the outlier here. Maybe they're o- making us overrate overrate him? Question mark? I'm Ron Burgundy? Yeah. Um, I don't. No, not feeling that. He's a mid-range number one wide receiver. I think maybe we were overrating him when we had him at one or two or three amongst the wide receivers because he was there for a lot of people. Yeah, I think I'm inclined to just still think he's awesome and capable of being 
a total beast and not get too in the weeds with the stats. There's just no reason at this point that you would value, value him over Chase or Jefferson. So like the, the best he could be is third. Okay, let's go to our third question. Here's a tight or fourth question. It's a tight end question. How much upside do TJ Hawkinson and Dallas Goddard actually have? Heath. And I asked this question because they've kind of been ranked, projected both in redraft and um, dynasty on like the theory of what they could be. We've we've projected that both these guys could jump into the top three. And I'm just, especially with Goddard, who's now going to be 27 at the start of the year, I'm not sure we have any reason to think that he could be a lot more than what he's been. Especially in an offense with Jalen Hurts at quarterback that's going to be extremely run heavy. Hawkinson kind of had his chance. I would doubt if the Lions go into this season thinking that Hawkinson's going to be their first option in terms of targets. I, I would say it's going to be ARSB, and there may be another wide receiver that's ahead of him as well. So I think my answer to that question would be they've got mid-range number one tight end upside, and they're not so old that you need to discount them for your age. So they are the number six and seven tight end in my, in my dynasty rankings. But I see people ranking Hawkinson ahead of Waller or ahead of Kittle or ahead of Kelsey because he's still 25 years old. And I just can't do that because I'm not sure he has the upside to give you a season like they can this year. Sure. What happens this year when he doesn't dominate for the lions and he's a good fantasy tight end, but he's not a difference maker for Detroit. Does Detroit give him a huge extension? Does he settle for a contract to stay in Detroit? Does he move on somewhere else? By the time that Dallas Goddard's arrow points straight down, Hawkinson might be on the same decline, maybe a little bit behind him. So I like Hawkinson better because he's younger and I think he's got maybe a little bit more time on the clock to be helpful for fantasy than Dallas Goddard. But there, to me, that's very close between the two. So close that if I were in a dynasty startup and I see Hawkinson go ahead of Goddard, I almost put the, the periscope up looking for Goddard within the next 12 or so picks after Hawkinson. And okay. I don't know that there's a whole lot of difference between another first round tight end for the Detroit Lions through three seasons. I mean, the, his rookie year was better, kind of. Well, you talking about Ebron? Two seasons from, well, how many seasons do we have from Hawkinson? I'm sorry. Three. Three? Three. three. He, is, he has been in the league for three years, and he has 1,600 yards and 12 touchdowns. So uh, if we could, yeah. But he, boy, did he come out firing. You know, his first two games, right? Yeah, he was amazing. 45 PPR points in those first two games. <laughs> yeah. Last 10 games, he's he had 420 yards and two touchdowns. And his 17-game pace was 714 yards, 76 catches, and three touchdowns in his last 10 games. Um, yeah, so I think if I actually wanted to talk about Goddard, if you don't mind, because he actually had, in terms of his rates, an incredible season. Yards per catch, his yards per target. 10.9 yards per target. Blew away his previous career high. How about this? He had nine games out of 15 with five or more targets. In those nine games, Dallas Goddard scored 12 or more PPR fantasy points seven times. 12 or more PPR fantasy points. That's what Darren Waller and Dalton Schultz basically averaged. They averaged just a little bit more than 12 PPR fantasy points per game. He got that or more in seven of nine games with only five or more targets. On a per-target basis, I don't know. Yeah. He may have been the best tight end in football he was so good very close to it anyway he was uh he was a top 10 tight end despite being 17th in targets i i would like that stat a lot more if most if he didn't have games in the second half of the season with two targets against the broncos three targets against got, the giants and four he targets he got hurt against the broncos he left pretty early okay the, the two games against the giants then yeah, he had yeah. a combined three catches for twenty eight yards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he had these games, and and there were a couple games where uh, Jalen Hurts threw sixteen or seventeen passes. So that's obviously a problem. And also, if you look at his last ten games after the Hurts trade, he caught two touchdowns. They were both in the same game, and they were both from Gardner Minshew. Jalen Hurts did not throw Dallas Goddard the ball in the end zone, near the end zone. It was very strange. I don't know how much Jalen Hurts threw the ball in the end zone in the second half. Right. Yeah. Not but much. he did have a 23% target share without Zach Ertz after the Ertz trade. 
and he was great per target. Really so I, I do wonder if that makes you think that there's more potential there. What I, you know, what I can look up really quickly is his target per route run rate after the Ertz trade. Okay, I bet that I bet that percentage is high. Anything that's higher than twenty percent is usually good for that. It started in week seven, so yeah. week seven so, to week seventeen. Give me thirty seconds. Okay. Oh, uh, that's oh, we got to do some trade talk too. We'll we'll do a which side do you want? By the way, Heath basically produced this show, so thank you to Heath for for great work there. And we had some comments I wanted to bring up from the chat, which was it's been a long time. Oh. Is it me or are all of you guys getting better looking every day? And then the next comment was, except Adam, LOL. That was interesting. <laughs> hey, I mean, if you're looking for island real estate or property management, we know where to go. Yes, Island Real Estate and Property Management Incorporated is asking these questions. He also asked, do you think Cam Akers is worth keeping in Dynasty and what round? In a, in a keeper league, Cam Akers anywhere from... I would say round four or later is worth the keep. I was going to say round three. So Sean Brenneman has Carter, Swift, Javante, Dobbins, and Hunt at running back. Dave, you should probably pay attention to this. I am. I am. The well, first of all, does Sean think we're getting more handsome? <laughs> uh, the Pitts owner wants DeAndre Swift. Would you make that trade? For sure. um, Hell yeah. I'd trade Swift for Pitts. That yeah, offer I, is not the pits. I like Swift more than Pitts. <laughs> but um I would I just can I can I get a second round pick thrown in and then I'd do it. Wow. Oh, you're so greedy. Looking for the Jerry Krause sweetener on top of it. No, wow. it's just I don't just I don't trying. have pits as high as Swift. What uh, okay, what's the your top five overall dynasty ranking? Uh Taylor, Chase, Jefferson, Harris, Swift. Taylor, Chase, Jefferson, Harris, Swift. Dave, what about you? It's probably something like that. How is Kyle Pitts not there? Um, oh, wait. Did you say Swift fifth? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, no. Swift isn't there for me. Pitts would be ahead of Swift. Okay. But a wide receiver might be ahead of Pitts. I don't, I don't have dynasty rankings. I probably should. Don't tell the boss. I've got the target per route run rate for... Yeah. For our guy, uh, twenty four percent. And is that good? Yes. Okay. All right. Which side would you rather have in trade? Austin Eckler and Chris Godwin, or J.K. Dobbins and Elijah Moore? Austin Eckler and Chris Godwin, or Dobbins and Elijah Moore? This is in Dynasty, obviously. I, I, okay, Dave, I think Dave, we're looking for you to answer him. <laughs> oh, okay. Because <laughs> well, this is based off Heath's trade. I, mean, I know my answer. I was giving Heath a shot. <laughs> no, all of these I put together for you guys. And I put that in the email, but um, I put okay. these together for you guys because they are all virtual ties in my dynasty rankings. And uh, I'm taking Eckler and Godwin. I'm taking Eckler and Godwin because you've got the win now factor for both of those guys. Not that you can't win now with Dobbins and more. Uh, I'm scared of what's coming for Dobbins coming off the ACL Ravens offense, potentially reverting back to where they were before this year. Lamar under center. That's going to take some work away from Dobbins. Gus is going to take work away from Dobbins. And as much as I love Elijah Moore, I don't know what to make of Zach Wilson. Not ready to say that Zach. Oh, don't worry about it. Zach will be better next year. I don't know if that's going to be true. I figure that Godwin will play somewhere where he's got a capable quarterback. He's also coming off of an ACL, right? He is, but I worse I think that there's still a lot of career left for Chris Godwin. He might not have a good year in 2022, but I think he's going to have a pretty strong career where he continues to be a, a target hog. 5 5 years, 5 more years for him. And Eckler doesn't have 5 years in front of him. He might not have more than 2 or 3, but I do think that Eckler will pay off better now than Dobbins will. And both of them five years from now might be afterthoughts in the National Football League. Okay, DeAndre Hopkins. This one is actually repulsive and makes my stomach hurt reading it. DeAndre Hopkins and Melvin Gordon or Rashad Bateman and Tony Pollard? I don't like it. Hopkins and Gordon or Bateman and Pollard? Who would you rather have? I'm holding on to the veterans. 
hoping that Hopkins can have a nice bounce back year, hoping that Melvin Gordon has a rear like he had last year. And maybe I can turn those two into something better at the trade deadline in my dynasty league or worst case scenario, I get numbers out of them in 2022 and I trade them off for maybe a slightly worse pair uh, in the spring of 2023. And that's the, that's the thing is I think, like I would understand, especially with Hopkins, if you want to hold on and see, because he could have two good games and a contender could believe he's back and then you could get something really good for him. But both Hopkins and Gordon could like if they if things go wrong, you're not getting a slightly worse pair for them. You're not getting a third round pick for them. Um, I I I look at this and I think Bateman was a late first round pick last year. I don't think you're getting more than a second for Melvin. So this is a lot like a late first and a second round pick for these two guys. If I'm not a contender, I'm easily taking a late first for Hopkins or a second for Gordon. I don't really know why people are so down on DeAndre Hopkins. He has oh, it's a because his aim receiver, and he still I think has what is he twenty nine this year? Yes. So I, I think, you know, just based on what receivers of his caliber have done, it's not uncommon for them to be good up till they're 31, 32. And I, it, I don't know. I think he's being judged a little bit too harshly on, on his yards from this past year. Personally. I do want to clarify that Hopkins he's being judged, judged harshly on his targets. And that might change because they let enough receivers go that he gets a bunch of targets, but his target share fell to like he and Christian Kirk and AJ green were basically taking turns, leading the team in targets. It was almost an even split at 20% for each of them, which is awful. And he will be 30 before this season starts. Mm, yeah. So I think what you said is right. Like you might get one or two more good years from Deandre Hopkins. Um, but again, he's one of those guys that the floor is almost nothing. If this year goes bad. His floor in terms of his dynasty value. Right. Right. All right. Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Yeah, so, an awesome so duo. Burrow and Kyle Pitts. Burrow and Pitts or Mahomes Ooh. and Kyle. I As tempted as I am to take the Chiefs combo, I, I believe that Kyle Pitts will be a productive tight end for many years, and that, that means the difference between Mahomes and Burrow, I'm not sure that that'll be a big difference. So I will take the Burrow Pitts side ahead of Mahomes and Kelsey. Mm, me too. I think everyone would, and I'm just going to be a homer um, <laughs> okay. and and yeah. defend the other side because, like I said, I think it's I, basically even. And if I was a contender, like I, I I'd be really tempted because I don't really th- like last year. Mahomes had his worst year, right? And Burrow. Averaged nine yards per attempt and had a 6% touchdown rate. And Mahomes was a point and a half better per game. I don't think we have any reason to expect that Burrow is going to close that gap in the coming year. Neither of these guys, they're basically the same age. Uh, Mahomes might be a year older. And Pitts, how, how much does he have to increase to get into Travis Kelsey's neighborhood in the next two years? He yeah. needs to score a bunch of touchdowns and uh, see a slight uptick in targets. But I think he's got the potential to see a significant uptick in targets and have several years where he's in the double-digit touchdown range. I, yeah, I, I think- wonder I wonder how many more years can we look at Travis Kelsey and say, that guy's going to get me 15 PPR points per game without me worrying a little bit. How I many I years do, it for do I have to wait for Kyle Pitts to get me 15 fantasy points per game? I think the answer to that might be zero. I think there's a chance that that could happen as soon as this coming year. And I know that Kelsey will do it again this coming year. Like, I feel that it's not crazy to say that. There's no reason to believe that there's a decline coming for Travis Kelsey other than looking at his birthday and saying, see, he's 33 years old. But two years from now, does Kelsey fall to father time while Kyle Pitts is on the up and up. <laughs> I think I would, I would hope so. <laughs> his football career would fall to father time, right? Not right. Uh, no, I mean that he like falls into a, you know, a pit. No, okay. oh, a pit. Okay. Yeah. Bottomless, bottomless. So he's just yeah. constantly like this. Like one of those baseball players in the Simpsons, that famous Simpsons episode, which one falls into a bottomless pit? Ozzie Smith, I think. Dave, we know, haven't heard from him in a long time. I think he falls in. I'm gonna. I gotta look this up before we go. All right. Anyway, that's it for today's show. 
uh, who oh, I don't have time to look this up. Oh, the bottomless pit. Uh, Ozzy <laughs> Smith. Yes. All right. We're out of here, everybody. We'll talk to you on Monday. With what if I gave a, you a 2023 first for Montgomery? And it might even be better than a late first. Who knows what it'll wait, be? Dave, take that. Uh, I might. Yes. Uh oh, I just got a buzz on my phone. Is this you, Heath, making no, the offer? It's not. It's Ozzy Smith. We're out of here. We'll talk to you Monday. We have a game called Mystery Draft or something like that. We're working on a title, but it should be a fun show on Monday with some NFL Combine notes from Jamie as he'll be back from the Combine. Uh, FFT and five, we got a free agency preview, so you can check that out. Have a great weekend, everybody. See ya.